All right, it's great. Uh, well, thanks for joining us today. So my name is Jason. I'm a product manager at Owen Labs, focusing on SNAPs. And we have Isaac, who is the uh, CTO of Owen Labs as well. Uh, so we're really excited to introduce SNAPS and, and tell you more about it. SNAPS is our smart contracting platform based off of Starks, ZK Starks, uh, and it has some unique characteristics because of that. Uh, we're gonna break this up into five sections. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the architecture, and then Isaac is gonna follow on uh, to teach more about Snarky JS, to go through a Hello World example, uh, some exercises that build up in difficulty, and then he'll wrap it up at the end. Okay, let's talk about architecture. Mina is a layer one blockchain launched March, 2021. Whereas other blockchains are large and increasing in size as new blocks are mined, for instance, Bitcoin is 378 gigabytes in size and Ethereum is over 1.1 terabytes. Mina remains a fixed 22 kilobytes in size. We call this a, a succinct blockchain. Using recursive ZK snarks, the current state of the blockchain can be compressed into a single ZK snark letting anyone instantly sync the blockchain and still get the security of a full node. An enormous amount of research spanning decades has gone on to the, into this across multiple teams. Uh, and in recent years, there has been significant progress around ZK Snarks. Recently, our cryptography team at Owen Labs has created a new, a new ZK Snark we call Kimchi, which is setup list, efficient, and extensible. It's based off 15 wire plonk. And with the Mina blockchain based on ZK Snarks, we're able to re-envision the design of a smart, contr smart contracting platform. So on Ethereum, the smart contracts execute on the chain. Users send a transaction specifying one of the methods of the smart contract to the chain with, along with data arguments. Every node across the Ethereum network executes these same instructions. It was once groundbreaking, but it's woefully inefficient. Mina snaps use a totally different model. Users execute one or more methods of the smart contracts locally and privately on their own computer, and then they generate a zero knowledge proof. They send a transaction containing the zero knowledge proof and a description of associated state updates to the chain. The Mina network then verifies that this proof is correct for that particular snap account. And if it is, the state is allowed to be updated. And if not, the transaction is rejected. Clients down the line can then verify the correct state of a SNAP account just by quickly verifying proofs sent to the SNAP accounts. There's no need to execute the full program like Ethereum would over and over in order to confirm it. So the program is only executed off-chain locally on the user's machine before it's sent to the Mina blockchain. This gives us a few advantages. We achieve blockchain scalability through succinctness because that's source of truth remains a constant 22 kilobytes in size. We also have the opportunity for user privacy through zero knowledge groups. Because these smart contracts are running locally, data can remain private or public depending on developer's choice when you write your smart contracts. Uh, and then because it runs off chain, you also get essentially unlimited off chain execution. It's really only limited by the developer's choice of how much time they want their app to execute. Um, it, in other words, it's not a gas fee based model where you have to worry about the, the time and, and cost of it executing on chain. How does this work? Uh, to define the terminology, a snap consists of two parts. We use the word snap to refer to both the user interface and the smart contract within it. So, for instance, the rest of this talk, Isaac is going to be referring to this, the smart contract within a particular snap. When a developer writes their smart contracts, it compiles down into two main artifacts. One is the prover function. This runs locally in a user's web browser and generates a zero knowledge proof. Secondly is the verification key, which is stored on chain. It's sent on chain when the developer deploys their smart, con smart contracts and it's used to verify the correctness of the execution. And so as mentioned, to, de to deploy a new smart contract or to update it, a developer has this verification key that they generated during the build process, and they send a transaction to the chain, to their SNAP, to their MENA address. And when that MENA address contains the verification key, we now call that a SNAP account because it now functions as a SNAP. Now, when a user interacts, as mentioned before, the 
the user sends a transaction containing a zero knowledge proof to the chain. And then that verification function, which is the verifier is mean in this case, it has to pass for the transaction to be valid and for the snap account state to be updated. And if that proof is invalid, the transaction is rejected. So to dive into one last part of, of kind of how this works before Isaac jumps into the next section, the smart contract methods can take certain inputs and certain outputs. So this will be good to know when we're looking at how SnarkyJS works. The inputs can be certain, it can be method arguments. So this could be data specified by the user in the local web browser when it, when it runs. So that's, you know, for instance, your private data. Uh, you can also have on-chain smart contract states. So existing states for that particular snap account. And you can have also, you can also have other values for uh, this, the state of the world. So you could have, for instance, the current block height uh, or you know, account balances, that type of thing. And then additionally, the smart contract method outputs updates to the state of the smart to, to the state of the smart contract and updates potentially uh, to the, the state of the world. All right, so then Isaac's gonna tell you more about SnarkyJS, which is used to write smart contracts. <clears throat> Thanks, Jason. Um, that was that was really good. Um, maybe uh, maybe I'll take over the screen sharing so I can just click the slides. Is that cool? Yeah, we're seeing some questions in here about is it based off zk rollup or optimistic rollups? Uh, just to clarify, while well, I was getting that set up, um, it's a layer one blockchain, uh, which is which is really unique to have this opportunity to use zero knowledge proofs on. The layer one. Cool. Um, can everyone see that okay? Jason, can you see that okay? I can see it. Great. Okay, everyone. Hello. Um, I apologize. I'm not a tomato. Um, and uh, I'm, I, I saw people saying I'm, I'm in a, uh, I'm, I'm a programmer in a basement. I guess that's kind of true. It's not a basement, but you know, something like that. Um, but yeah, so anyway, just to pick up from, from where Jason left off. So um, SnarkyJS is, uh, it's how you write snaps, smart contracts um, for Mina. And um, uh, it's, it itself is a TypeScript library. So um, basically it uses existing open technologies. Uh, that is to say, you know, Node.js and the browser. Um, and because it's just a TypeScript library, you can use existing JavaScript and TypeScript libraries and tools. So you don't have to learn a whole new uh, development environment, um, a whole new syntax, you know, a whole new set of tools. Um, you just use kind of uh, the existing TypeScript tools, which are really robust um, because there's been you know thousands and thousands of person hours invested in them. Um, and moreover, uh, you know, a, a specific instance of that is we have really good VS code support. Um, so we'll, we'll be seeing that later on um, in, in, in the presentation. So um, uh, yeah, so like the intended uh, development environment for SnarkyJS is, is using VS code. I mean, you can use whatever TypeScript or JavaScript um, environment you want, but I can, I can report that the VS code support is very good. Um, so just to kind of start things off, um, the basic unit of data in zero knowledge programming is a field element. And I, I'm sure you've uh, heard about this a lot throughout all the presentations. So um, it, hopefully this is familiar to you, but basically um, a field element is, is like a number, um, a very big number. So a number which is almost 256 bits in size. Actually, um, our specific field, uh, it's a little bit uh, less than 255 bits, but um, you know you can think of it as being something quite similar to you at 256 in Solidity. Um, so, uh, what can you do with field elements? Basically, um, the basic operations you can perform with them are like addition, multiplication, division, subtraction, that kind of thing. But we can build all sorts of things uh, out of them, and in fact, the standard library for SmartJS has already done done so. Um, so in SnarkyJS, this is represented by a TypeScript type called field. Um, and 
Yeah. So uh, in typical, you know, TypeScript or JavaScript programming, you could write, you know, this like sum, the sum of two numbers is, you know, one plus three. Um, in Snarky.js, because field is kind of its own type, you need to, you know, kind of wrap it. So um, the way that you write like a new, you know, create field elements is, is you write new field, um, uh, you know, with some input, which would be a number or a string representing, you know, the valued field element, and then you can do use dot add on that. Um, and actually, so here, you know, we, we have like new field one dot add new field three. Um, for convenience, this can actually just be simplified to just say like dot add the number three um, and Snarky.js can, you know, figure out how to wrap that. Um, cool. So I'm, I'm going to be looking at the questions every now and then, but it um, looks like we're all good. So uh, there's a lot of other built-in types besides field elements. Um, so as I said, there's field, there's also UN64, UN32, public key, private key, and signature. So there's a built-in um, signature scheme library into the standard library um, because that's a really common kind of functionality that people would want, you know, want to use in smart contracts. Um, there's also types for sort of representing optional data, Booleans, um, a group type for sort of, you know, in, uh, representing an elliptic curve, which is useful for a lot of cryptographic schemes. Um, and these all have built-in methods on them that we'll see uh, in, in, in a little bit. So to sum up, there's a whole bunch of useful functionality um, provided in the standard library, and uh, it has an all has a nice TypeScript interface. And we'll, 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 see, we'll see that a little bit. So uh, just a bit of a primer on some of the basics of Snarky.js. So uh, as I said, it's a TypeScript library. Um, and programming is very much as it is in TypeScript or JavaScript. So just to give a really simple example, um, here's a function that takes in an input field element X and outputs a field element. So this is how you write this. Um, and it, it works uh, by, you know, the function is called add one and double. So what's it gonna do? It's gonna take an X, it's gonna add one to it and it's gonna multiply it by, multiply it by two. And that's exactly what right, X dot add one dot mult two. And, you know, just to kind of show you a little bit of syntax, um, if you want to create an intermediate variable, um, you just do it like you do in JavaScript or TypeScript. You can use let um, or const uh, if people are familiar with JavaScript. Um, and, you know, you can define this intermediate value, x plus 1, just do x dot add 1, and then you just return, you know, x plus 1 dot mult 2. So, oh, so, okay, so, uh, just to kind of sum this up, like uh, the basic syntax of it is just TypeScript. It's just JavaScript, it's just TypeScript. So if you're familiar with that, um, it is Snarky.js will be very familiar to you. Um, from here, we're going to basically uh, look at a hello world uh, snap example to kind of get our feet wet with um, uh, how programming smart contracts in Snarky.js looks. So um, to get set up, there's three things that uh, that we need to do. And I know that this takes basically five minutes because I just did it right before this workshop because I'm on a Mac, which I usually don't use. Um, so the first thing you wanna do is install VS Code. Um, if you have VS Code installed already, great. Um, otherwise, there's a link in the slides. The slides should be in the chat. Um, and then the second thing you wanna do is uh, install Node.js. Uh, with NPM version 16 or later, um, you can you can use uh, the, the link here. And then the third thing is you're going to clone the uh, Git repo specific to the workshop. So um, I can drop these links in the chat uh, for people to install. And I'm gonna, I'm just going to wait like a couple minutes here um, for anyone who you know wants wants to do that. Um, so just putting in the chat now, and I'm going to put the git link to is node 14 not supported. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, um, sorry. It is, it is supported, but you have to run it with a specific flag. Let me look it up. 
Okay. Uh, maybe actually Gregor can post it because I don't have a phone You can use 17 too. I, um, so I, I'm, I just tried it with 17. So I know 16 or later works. I think, um, yeah, as Jason said, if you run it with an earlier version, you'll have to use a specific flag. Um, oh, I want, yeah, okay, looks good. <sighs> Anyone else getting an error that repo does not exist? Hmm. Oh, did I forget to? Oh, sorry. Shit. I. I. Uh, my bad. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I forgot to put HTTPS on the thing. I guess. Oh no no no! It's that uh, actually that they delete the HTTP. Yeah. Okay. That's annoying. So, so, uh, yeah, so basically I, oh, wow. Someone figured out how to do it. Right click paste. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, thank you to, to Joe for Arnold for, and, and, uh, and Yunnan Shi for, uh, putting the right way to clone the Git repo. Just a quick question, Isaac, um, and actually, Jason, are you seeing the screen? Because for me right now, it's gray, and I just want to make sure that there's still something up. Yeah, I can, I can see the screen. You're seeing it OK? All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's back for me. Weird. How's everyone doing? Well, I, I guess people can't reply, but I hope everyone's doing well. Um, it's a nice morning over here, you know, having some coffee. Mm. Oh yeah, people can reply in the chat, that's good. Oh, there's some questions in the Q&A tab, okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to, while we're waiting for people to get installed, I'm going to wait a few more minutes. Um, I'm just going to read some of the questions in the Q&A tab. So Anonymous asks, well, no, no, I'll go in reverse order. Haresh G asks, since the computation is off chain, is it fair to say user could be censored to use the snap? So Haresh, that depends on how the snap is set up. So uh, in the typical setup, no, the user cannot be censored because uh, there will be a permissionless, you know, way for the user to run the application um, and, and they will just execute it on their own hardware, um, like on their laptop or on their phone or whatever, um, and then post a proof uh, to Mina. And, you know, Mina is like a normal blockchain, like censorship resistant. So that execution proof is going to get incorporated into Mina um, as, you know, just, just as like a normal, like kind of smart contract transaction would get incorporated into um, like Ethereum. So uh, Anonymous asks, why would you want to add and multiply field elements instead of uints? Uh, that's a good question. So um, let me put it like this. Uh, well, first of all, there are certain settings where you just want field elements. So like, for example, if you're doing operations with an elliptic curve or um, with some kind of scheme, cryptographic scheme, very often, uh, you need to you need to use field elements um, because you need to be able to divide basically. So in a field you can divide um, in in a nice way. In uh, in with uint two fifty six or whatever you can't really divide exactly. You can sort of divide, but it's not real. It's not really division, um, and so you can't do all the things that you sometimes need to do in a field. Um, so uh, and then the the second thing is. Uh, Field elements are kind of the native value in um, in most proof systems, and in particular in our Kim proof system. So, um, 
what I mean by that is, you know, like on uh, a CPU, Intel CPU, let's say, uh, the native value is maybe, well, I don't know, it's maybe a little bit hard to say, but like natively it supports operations for like doing 64-bit integer arithmetic, for example. Uh, that's the same in, in our proof system. The native kind of operation that's supported is field arithmetic. So um, that's kind of the native value. Uh, okay, so mo just moving along, Mursad uh, uh, Ayanovich asks, do we have to code along? Um, you don't have to, it's up to you. Um, oh man, so many questions. Uh, Kobe asks, is a snap dev company gonna be running their own proofs or will they part of, be part of, of the snark marketplace or some kind of distributed worker pool? So uh, again, it kind of depends on the setup of the application. Um, you could deploy a snap that has, you know, that is sort of uh, running as maybe kind of like a roll up situation, in which case, you know, you might have one operator, you might have an operator, or you could have snaps that, um, you know, the, the prover, uh, the user kind of executes the proof individually and then kind of broadcasts it, broadcasts it to the MENA network and it'll be part of the snark marketplace there. Um, Marcos asks, is the work, workshop code yarn compatible? I don't know. Um, maybe Gregor or uh, Brandon, if you know, or Martin in the chat can, can answer. Um, what's the equivalent of etherscan.io for Mina? Um, forgive the perhaps dumb question. Is code visible for a smart contract? How does this pr privacy visibility trade-off work? That's a very good question. Um, so uh, there are Mina block explorers. Um, if you, for example, if you go to minaexplorer.com, you can uh, find a very good block explorer. Um, it's not a dumb question at all. Is code visible for a smart contract is an excellent question. Um, by default, it's not. So uh, what happens is basically the, when you deploy a snap account, you put kind of like a commitment or a hash of the code on chain. And then uh, later people will come along and post proofs that kind of verify against that commitment or hash of the code. So by default, the code is actually not available on chain. Um, but, you know, in, in most applications or in a lot of applications, you would want to share the code so that people could interact with the smart contract. Um, okay, uh, Bo Yao asks, what kind of off-chain calculation can you use? You can, you can do anything. Um, it won't necessarily be verified, but you can do anything that you can do in JavaScript. Um, Fran uh, Francesco asks, uh, are snaps composable? Yes, they are. We, if we have time, we'll get into a, that a little bit. Um, Florian asks, we touch on token as well. I've seen references to token ID and token symbol in the code. I won't uh, be discussing that in this workshop, unfortunately, but um, I can try and say something about it at the end. Um, and Jeff asks, do you have a few examples in the context of decentralized ZK rollups? I'm interested in de decentralized provers, especially, and it seems SnarkJS may allow for the development of peer-to-peer uh, -peer ZKers. Um, at the end of this workshop, I'm gonna show a little example that has to do with rollups, um, and you know maybe you can uh, draw. You know, you could build a, a browser-based peer-to-peer zk rollup using it actually. So, but we'll 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 get to that in time. Okay, um, I'm gonna uh, assume that people are are installed now. It's been a while, um, and uh, you know, uh, keep going. So. All right, hopefully everyone is in a, good, in a good place. It's been about almost 10 minutes. So, uh, you know, hopefully that's good. And let's move on. Right, so uh, hopefully you've cloned the workshop. Please CD into the workshop and run uh, workshop repo directory and run npm install. Um, hopefully that works. Um, and we're going to now go through Hello World together. So um, we're going to write a very simple smart contract with a single state variable named X. Okay. It will have a method called update that will let us replace X with its square. So like, for example, if X starts out being three, um, if we call update, we can provide update, you know, with the square of X nine and the smart contract will say, yep, that looks good. That's the square of the current state and replace uh, the current state value with nine. Then we can do, you know, once it's nine, we can do update 81, 81 being nine squared, um, and that will set the new state to, to 81. 
Um, and just to kind of drive the point home, um, let's say, you know, we perform our first update, x is 9, and then we try and call update with something which is not 9 squared, like 75. Then basically, uh, the execution will abort, um, and it'll say, hey, very bad, you did the wrong thing, um, and it will not let us update the, the state to 81, or to, to 75, rather. So um, to write a snap, uh, what you do concretely is you create a class um, which extends the smart contract class of Snarky.js. So um, it's as simple as that. Uh, and the way that you declare, well, okay, so like a snap can contain some on-chain state. Um, and uh, the way that you declare this on-chain on state is basically by writing properties for your class and annotating them with uh, the type of the field, the type of the property that is, that is and with the state decorator. So um, here we're declaring a state variable, on-chain state variable x. Um, this says it's a state variable of type field, and this also says it's a state variable of type field. Um, it's, a, it's, I apologize for the slight verbosity. Um, and uh, only by default, only types built out of field can be used for state variables. And I'll get into a little bit what that means in a bit. Um, so uh, this is a lot like how it works in Solidity. This is very similar concept in Solidity. You know, you declare, when you, when you write your smart contract, you kind of declare a class like this, and you, you, you define properties on this, that class in much the same way. Um, so it's very similar. So uh, the next ingredient in defining a snap is to define the constructor. So this describes how the snap will be initialized when it's deployed. Um, there's two kind of parameters that you, you pretty much are always going to have um, when you define a snap, which is the initial balance of the snap account and the public key um, that owns the snap account. So uh, this is what a constructor looks like. Um, oh yeah, so in addition, this constructor is going to take the initial value for the uh, uh, account state x. And um, it's as simple as, you know, so you call super address. So that's just something you always do. Um, you basically add to the initial balance, you add to the balance of the account, the initial balance that's provided. And uh, you initialize the x uh, state, state variable with um, this value x that's provided. Um, now, uh, once we've deployed a smart contract, we want to start giving it behavior. So um, any smart contract can, can contain multiple methods that each have their own logic. So um, the way that we define that um, is by defining methods on the class. So um, for each method, you, you basically write at method, then, okay, so this method happens to be async, and I'll get into that uh, in a minute. Um, it's called update, and it takes one parameter, which is a field element. Um, so what's this method going to do? Basically, first, it's going get, to get the on-chain state of the x uh, state variable. Um, then it's going to uh, square it and assert that that is equal to the provided argument. Um, and then it's going to set the on-chain state variable to that squared value. So in essence, what this is doing is exactly what um, we described on, on a few slides ago, which is it's, it is a method on the smart contract that can be called uh, only with the square of the current state variable. So as long as you provide the square of the current state variable, um, this uh, assertion here, x.square.assert equals squared, is going to pass. And then it will allow us to get through to this line, the final line, which sets the, uh, sets the on-chain state to that squared value. And um, the methods of a smart contract, just like in Ethereum, basically describe um, how it can be an, uh, invoked when you, deploy, when you deploy it. So just a note on you know, what's public, what's private. The state of a snap, that is what's defined uh, with these state variables, is public. Um, it's on-chain and it's public unless it's explicitly stored as a commitment to the state. So, um, you know, for example, uh, a very common pattern would be 
to store on chain the uh, root of a Merkle tree. And then, um, you know, so that's like a commitment to the state. It's hidden. The state is hidden in that case. And, and uh, store the Merkle tree off chain somewhere uh, private. Um, either like on a user's own device or in some kind of, you know, private cloud setting, um, and then uh, interact, interact, provably interact with that state by using um, like the Merkle tree functionality in SnarkyJS, um, and that so that would like keep the on-chain state hidden, but um, uh, still have the the chain be kind of publicly available in a sense. Um, now, what's private? Uh, any argument to a method. Oops, sorry. Any argument of a method is private. Um, this comes from the zero knowledge that's that's used um, here, unless, for example, um, a method like takes that argument and then stores it into a state, then it would become public. But um, we'll see examples later on of where it's very clear kind of like how uh, the method, you know, how the arguments of methods are, are, are private. Um, So uh, just a note on this async here next to the definition of update. Um, the update method is async because it calls dot get. So uh, it goes to the chain and uh, grabs the value from the chain. Um, and so that's why it has to be async. Um, it, because you know we're actually running this off chain. So this like fetch of like going to the chain and, and grabbing the value from it is gonna be async. And we can use this really nice async await syntax in JavaScript to make that nice. Um, so uh, I'm just going to pause for a second now and just look in the comments uh, if there's anything here. Okay. Seems like a lot is uh, being covered. answered. Yeah. All right. If, uh, if you do want to take any question, just remember to read the question so that um, we can also hear the question and the answer for the video after. Okay. That, that makes sense. Um, cool. So uh, there was a good question here. Well, they're mostly being answered. Oh, okay. So someone asked, oh, this is a very interesting question. Why is the dot set method not async or is it, but you forgot to uh, call a wait? Actually, it's not async. And um, the reason for that, we will understand in the next slide. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide and then we, we can try and understand that a little bit. So let's think deeply about what happens when we call uh, on this snap in terms of what is the actual zero knowledge proof that we do? What is it that we actually prove? Here's what we prove. Quote, we ran the code in the update method with some arguments and the resulting uh, effect was uh, perform the following updates, set X to be nine, assuming the precondition x equals three. So uh, basically, when we run this, this snap locally, we get out a proof that says, I am allowed to update the state of the account for this contract to nine, assuming uh, that x is currently equal to three. So um, I think Jason covered this a little bit. Um, when we actually run a snap, what we're doing is we're generating like updates to the on-chain state given some preconditions. Um, and then those preconditions will be checked on chain before the snap transaction is actually applied. So this answers the question of why is set not async because actually uh, it's more like proposed setting. So, um, uh, you know, we're kind of in a fantasy world on our own local computer. We can do whatever we want. We can say, yes, set this to that, set this to that, set this to that. And it's all okay as far as we, you know, by us. Uh, and then we're going to send that to the chain and the chain is going to say, you know, then actually perform the setting. So, um, and we'll see how we actually can wait on that execution. But um, yeah, like 
in the context of a single snap where we can just go set willy nilly because we're just kind of operating on our local view. Um, okay, so, uh, all right. So, okay, so Philip asked what happened if multiple people run update nine concurrently? That's a good question. The updates will be, will, uh, only one of them will happen, you know, most likely, unless they don't require, you know, unless their preconditions are not conflicting. So, but in this case, um, you know, only only one of them them will be performed. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep keep on going here. Um, so just to summarize uh, the anatomy of a of a smart contract, um, we have state variables, which are public. We have the constructor, which describes how the uh, how the contract can be deployed, and um, we have methods. Uh, in which arguments are private by default. That is to say they're private except for what's it sort of explicitly exposed about them. Um, and uh, what the methods do is they produce sort of these preconditioned updates. Okay. Um, so now we're gonna recall that we downloaded uh, the Git repo and NPM and stuff, and we're gonna run Hello World. Um, and this is as simple as running the following command. We wanted to kind of show you what's going on under the hood. All that we're doing is running the TypeScript compiler and then running node on um, the resulting file. So I'm gonna paste this command into the chat. Uh, give me a second. Okay, so everyone, yeah, great. Okay, Alexei uh, was able to run it. So, um, Oh, yarn running sec. Okay, I guess we can do that too. Great, it runs okay. So let's 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 take a look at um, what we are actually doing with that run. And now I'm going to share my editor. I guess I'll, Isaac did. I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate. Um, so why is set not awaited? Um, and the reason is that because the smart contract executes locally in the web browser, um, we wouldn't want to set the state while that smart contract is being updated. Because let's say the user never sends the transaction to the chain or that transaction is rejected by the chain. You don't want to have updated it during the contract execution. So instead, when the smart contract executes, it outputs both a proof and um, a list of associated state updates. Um, and to add a little more detail, these state updates are also uh, passed as one of the inputs while the proof is generated. So when both these pieces are sent to the chain, we know by having passed them in, we know that those state updates are, are, are valid and accurate for that proof and that transaction. And then if that proof passes on chain, we know that the, tr the transaction is, is appropriate and has run the proper expected code as well. And then we can update the state at that time. So it's the, the, the state update is occurring when the transaction arrives at the chain and not during the execution in the browser. So that's why it's not awaited in the browser. Hey again. Hey. Are snaps composable? Uh, yes. So um, we have not um, implemented this yet, but um, well, fully, it, the, the back end is, but you can, uh, a snap can call another snap. And, and, and pass data in between the two. So yes, they mm. are uh, composable. Oh, what a pain. Is this the eight field array publicly visible on the blockchain? Yes, it is. So what the question is about is we have eight fields of 32 bytes of, of on-chain storage right now. Um, it's arbitrary in the sense that the, the Snap developer can choose what data they want to store there. Um, and one thing that we're exploring for the future additionally is uh, using off-chain states. So what you could potentially do is store the root of a, of a Merkle tree in that on-chain storage and then store the actual data itself and uh, some kind of other decentralized storage off-chain. Uh, so yeah, I think that answers that. Let's see what else. Uh, 
Are you, Jason, just a quick question. Are you seeing the questions coming in on QA as latest? Because there's like a bunch of new ones kind of popping up at the top. Oh, okay, great, that's up. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Snaps gets the call snaps to the negative. Okay, I'll do this one right now. Yes. Oh, let's also explain uh, a little more about, I saw a good question earlier about where does the smart contracts execute? I mean, so we, so we already, or where does the contract code live? Um, so we mentioned it, it executes in the web browser and that a snap it equates, in our terminology, equates to the user interface uh, plus a smart contract. So as an analogy, let's say that you go to the uh, Uniswap website. There's a user interface for people to interact with it. Uh, but in our case, there is the actual smart contract code that lives there as well. So the developer sends that smart contract JavaScript and WASM code with their website. Uh, and if you're concerned about security with this, just remember that we're generating a zero knowledge proof. So that zero knowledge proof will only be accepted by the chain if it matches to the proof of function to the code that that developer had deployed. So you don't have to worry about security risk in that uh, at all. Um, but so where does the code live? The smart contract code itself, um, it just lives as part of the, the developer's website. Uh, the JavaScript. Okay, it says if a value is sent to the chain, how long is it stored there? So um, let's let's say when, when state is updated on a snap account, how long does it remain there? Uh, because that's how values would be stored, right? Um, uh, permanently. So it, it will remain in the, the on-chain storage will remain there permanently. Um, and also uh, uh, how the mean of blockchain works, we, we have the recursive zero snark, which represents, I like to call it the source of truth. Um, it's what allows people to interact with the node without having to download the entire history. Um, but that history is still available. Um, through other node operators, we call them archive node operators, and, and they have the opportunity to 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 store it in any different location. It's really their choice, um, and but uh, that has the the full history. So in this case, we will have something called events, which update the state on a snap account, um, and you could, for instance, see the entire event history uh, associated with that snap account. Uh, which would live on the archive node, but not on, but it wouldn't be needed for uh, knowing the, again, like this, the source of truth, knowing that for achieving that full code, full node consensus, uh, you you don't need the entire history. That's that's the advantage of the, the recursive zero stars. Okay. So yeah. Right. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to think... uh, hop back in. Yeah. So... And so Jason, you and I need to bounce off so that we have the the full screen for folks to see that. Um, yeah, it's a bit, sometimes it's a bit tricky to look at code. So also just maybe pay attention. You can close the chat. If you want your screen to be a little bit bigger, you can also make it full screen. Okay. I'm going to jump off too. Cool. Um, yeah, just let me know if uh, it's hard to see. So, um, right. So, okay. Everyone ran the Hello World. Um, that's really great. It looks like everyone got the expected output. And I just wanted to kind of run through with everyone what it looks like to actually call the smart contract. So um, first, the first thing that we do is uh, we set the kind of active instance of Mina that we're using to be this local mock blockchain just for testing. And you can see like the VS code supports really nice. So we can hover over local blockchain and we get um, uh, we get this doc comment. Okay, so local blockchain, a mock Mina blockchain running locally and useful for testing. Great, that's what we're doing. Um, then we're going to set the active instance just this local one. Um, we grab a few test accounts that are just, you know, we're going to be using them for sending transactions, um, create a P pair for our snap. Um, and then we are going to create a instance of our Hello World snap app. And the way that we do that is by create, calling Mina.transaction. So Mina.transaction is how we actually like create a snap transaction. And within the function that we provide to Mina.transaction is where we actually run our computation. So 
what we're going to do inside of this first transaction is just deploy the snap. So how that's going to work is we're going to basically create a transaction that involves that's sent uh, involving account two. Um, account two is going to uh, send this amount. Um, and the way that it sends it is just by decrementing its own balance by that amount. And then we're going to call uh, new all with our uh, snap uh, class with the, the, the given amount, the public key that we defined, and the initial state for the snap, which we defined to be three. So that is how we initialize the snap instance. And then we call, you know, that's going to give us a transaction. We'll call that send on it. And then we wait for that transaction to be sent. Um, Next thing we're going to do is create a new transaction for updating the snap. Um, again, we call media.transaction. Within that, we can call our snap method update um, and provide the square. So we do snap instance.update um, with the squared value. Uh, and then uh, we're going to uh, do a failed update, um, which uh, a lot of you already noticed. So um, we're going to try and call update with the wrong value, 109. And as people pointed out, this is going to fail because 109 is not 9 squared. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how the hell world uh, looks. And now with that, I'm going to return to the slides. So one second. I guess I'll turn my video back on. A different computer now. Cool. Um, can we see that? Yep. So uh, back to the exercises. So um, now that we have seen Hello World and we have kind of a feel for how Snap accounts look and Snap transactions look, we're going to uh, do a few exercises together. Um, and I just want to call out. Um, how to kind of get a sense of the API. So there's two good ways of doing that. One is we have an API reference, um, API reference docs available here at this URL. Um, and you can, you know, go through the, the slides to grab this URL. But the other way that's really good is just by using autocomplete. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we have really good VS code integration because it's just TypeScript. Um, and uh, on anything, you know, uh, any, any value, you can just type, you know, period and to see all the methods. Um, and uh, VS Code also shows doc comments. So um, there's inline documentation as well. Um, all right, so let's do our first exercise together. Um, this is, will be a little bit of a warm up. Um, as we kind of went over already, we're going to be using a mock MENA environment that just runs locally. Um, and our first exercise, uh, is going to be the following. So open uh, the file one underscore exercise dot ts. It's in source. Um, and what we're going to do here is, impl is implement update so that uh, instead of setting x to its square, we're going to set x to its cube. OK? So for example, 3 should be able to be updated to 27. And then 27 should be, up be able to up be updated to 27 cubed, which is 19,683. So that's going to be the first um, exercise. And yeah, please, um, please try that um, in on your own. Looks like we got our first uh, finish from Shakeb. Nice, nice job. Um, you know, I'm sure is asking how to finish. Um, so, right, yeah, just do the to do in the file. So, if you open, ex sorry, if you open one underscore exercise.ts, you'll see on line um, 25, I believe, um, that there is an error. Uh, and the goal is to basically update, update this method so that similar to exercise one, where we set the value to x squared, instead set it to x cubed. Oh, you know, I finished it five minutes ago. Okay, nice. You get the bragging rights. <laughs> All 
Yeah, so Zuhair says, there, cube doesn't exist. That's right, there is no cube method. You need to uh, implement it in terms of the methods that are available, like, yeah, dot mall, for example, you could use, or dot square. Hey, no spoilers, Francesca. Um, okay, so uh, looks like some people um, had success. Uh, gonna uh, gonna move on here. Um, our next exercise is gonna just explore hashing in Snarky.js just to get uh, a little experience with the API. So um, you can open the file to exercise.ts and um, what what you're gonna do there is use use the function Poseidon.hash, which is provided by Snarky.js. So that X is set to, instead of being set to its cube, it's gonna be set to its image under the Poseidon hash function, okay? Um, so that is a pretty similar exercise. You should be able to just see that. Um, I'm just gonna answer just a question from this, uh, from Anonymous. Are there benchmarks available and how long it takes to produce a proof? Running it on my PC it seems to take about four seconds. How does execution time grow? Linear? Okay, so two things. Um, basically all of that four seconds actually comes from loading uh, WASM. So in a, in a real application, that would be kind of like just an initialization time and we're, we're working on, on cutting that down because it, it really shouldn't take that long. So um, Snarky.js runs using Rust code that's been compiled to WASM. And, and basically all of that four seconds is um, uh, coming coming from from Watson. But yeah, in general, execution time is, you know, roughly linear in the complexity of the computation. All right, so this will have to be resolved after the workshop. It does seem that there's some bug um, in the example code um, because it's not setting the value to the correct uh, Poseidon value. It's actually just setting it. It's not setting it at all. It's actually failing to update it, I think. So um, we'll return to that later, but it's annoying. Um, all right. Oh, so Luca asks, can we see the solution anywhere? Yes. Um, two things. If you ever want to see the solution, there is a branch called solve. Um, and so you can just check out the solved branch. Uh, yeah, um, and let me just run through the solution really quickly. So this one was slightly different from the other exercises. So uh, in this exercise, um, you have to call the Poseidon.hash function and notice that it takes an array of field elements. So you just pass it in an array of field elements and set X to that value. But as I mentioned, something funny is going on because um, the correct value should be this, which is just the hash of three with Poseidon. But for some reason it's not updating. So um, I guess a last minute uh, update just to, to, to the, this workshop code uh, introduced some bugs somewhere. So. I apologize, um, it, it was working the other day um, when I ran it last, so um, we'll, we'll go back and, and you know make sure nothing funny is going on there. Um, cool. So let's move on to the next exercise. Um, so the third thing, we're not gonna do it as an exercise because there's too many concepts introduced, so I'm just gonna explain it how, how it works. Um, and that is payments. So, um, you know, on Mina, there is a cryptocurrency called Mina. Um, and uh, very often what you want to do is move, you know, money around basically. So this can be done in Snarky.js. Um, I'm going to walk through with you, you, you all how to do this. Um, so what you're going to want to do is open three exercise.ts and I'm going to open it here and then we're going to go through it together. The branch should be called solved, I believe, unless it's not pushed. All 
All right, everyone. Uh, cool. So three exercises. Let's go through it together. So this, the way that this is going to work is it's basically going to be the same as exercise two, where we update the state by replacing it with the, with the Poseidon hash. But uh, what we're going to do in, in this case is anyone who updates the state, we're going to give a reward. We're going to give them some mina for performing the very useful task of doing a Poseidon hash. And uh, the reward that we're going to give them is going to be one, three, three, seven minas. Um, so our constructor here is just a vanilla constructor, the same as we've seen so far. So I'll just kind of close that. Um, and now let's look at the update method. So you'll notice this is the same as it was in the solution to exercise two. We just set the state to the Poseidon hash. But in addition, we call this dot balance dot sub in place. Uh, reward. So what, what that means is when you call update, you're also going to subtract from this, the, the snap accounts balance, the value 1337. Okay. And you can see there's this dot balance dot add in place and there's this dot balance dot sub in place. So what that means is when you call this, this, this uh, method, the accounts balance is going to be decremented by 1337. And what that's going to do is basically make available 1337 for any other party in that transaction to add to their balance. So if you look at how this is actually used um, in the transaction that where we call update, we're able to create another account uh, corresponding to account two, and then we can do winner.balance.add in place the same reward. And the reason this works is when we run this transaction, it checks that all of the changes to the balances sum up to zero. So what that means is no mina is created or destroyed. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's a valid transaction. So that's how payments work right now in Snarky.js is um, by modifying the account's balances. And we can go ahead and update this. Uh, Cool, and you can see um, once we've updated that the winner the winner balance has had one three three seven added to it um, to have this grand total. So that's a bit on how to do payments in Snarky.js um, by modifying account balances. Okay, cool. <laughs> Someone asked, "How do you burn Mina? Is there a burn address?" Florian replies, uh, you can use my address as a burn address. So if anyone wants to burn Mina, just send it to Florian. Um, cool. All right, moving on. Great. So uh, just to kind of review the, the payments, you basically use dot balance dot add in place and dot balance dot sub in place. And that's how you can move Mina around between accounts. Um, and then, as I mentioned, all balance changes in a transaction have to sum to zero. Okay, so exercise four is just going to explore how you can use functions and loops um, in Snarky.js. So, um, as I've mentioned, in Snarky.js, we can just define normal TypeScript functions, and we can also use normal for loops. So, um, what that looks like is just a JavaScript or TypeScript for loop. Um, you know, here's a for loop, for example. Um, and it's you can you can use it just as well in Snarky.js. So um, for this exercise, open the file for exercise.ts, um, and in that file, there's a function um, called hash n times. And the idea of this function is is it should provide it should um, apply the Poseidon hash function n times. Uh, so you give it a number n and an input, and it should hash that input. Um, n times, um, and uh, you should use a for loop to, well, or whatever you want. Maybe you could also use recursion, I guess, um, to implement that function. Use normal for loops. So um, what that looks like is just a JavaScript or TypeScript for loop. Um, you know, here's a for loop, for example. Um, and it's, you, can, you can use it just as well in Snarky.js. So um, for this exercise, open the file for exercise.ts. 
Um, and in that file, there's a function um, called hash n times. And the idea of this function is, is it should provide, it should um, apply the Poseidon hash function n times. Uh, so you give it a number n and an input, and it should hash that input um, n times. Um, and uh, you should use a for loop to, well, or whatever you want. Maybe you could also use recursion, I guess, um, to implement that function. B said, I can run three without a balance. Actually, yes. So in the mock Mina environment, it doesn't enforce uh, that that the sum is exactly zero. I believe that it enforces that it's a, that it's greater uh, or that no Mina is created, but it's possible you actually can burn Mina in the mock environment. On chain, you cannot burn Mina. So that's, a, I guess, a discrepancy that should be resolved. Someone asked, can you send Mina from within a smart contract function? Can you verify the address that Mina is sent to somehow? Um, can, Philip, can you? Can you elaborate on that question? I'm not sure I understand. We have a bunch of people who were able to do this, so that's awesome. Gonna wait a few more minutes and then we can go through the solution together. Um, okay. So uh, let's see, Philip was, I'm just gonna go back to Philip's question. To me, it seems like exercise three only subtracts smart contract balance so that in the same transaction, anyone can claim that subtracted balance. But is there a way for the smart contract to limit the balances that the reward can be sent to? Yes, um, you can, uh, you can, you know, enforce that um, the receiver is equal to some specific public key that, you know, you compute or depends on some other part of the computation. You can, you can do that. Um, great. So a lot of people got this, um, answer and I'm just going to share my screen to show everyone how it looks. So, right. We wanted to implement this function hatch n times. Um, it's as simple as the following, but I'll, I'll actually just rewrite it. So first we're going to just say, okay, the result initializes this variable res result to X, and then we write a simple for loop. So let I equal zero, oops, I is less than M plus plus I, and then we're going to say res is equal to Poseidon dot hash. Uh, and then we need to provide an input and we're going to provide res. So we hatch ourselves. Um, n times, and then we just return that. And then um, when we run it, we get as, uh, well, first there was to do, but then we get as people have been posting in the chat, um, this value ending in 864. So that's the result of hashing the initial state value into itself uh, 10 times. Cool. Oh, you, yeah, you're not sure has their recursive, recursive example. I guess we could do that too. That's pretty cool. So, um, skip that. So, that what you know said was, oh, if n is equal to zero, return x. Oops, x. Otherwise, um, uh, side in dot hash of hash n times minus one x. No. Uh, 
I guess that's right. I mean, that's not tail recursive or whatever, but um, does that work? Let's see. I don't know. It's kind of fun to do recursion, I guess. Uh, yeah, cool. Works just as well. If you want to be fancy. Um, cool. All right, so let's move on to our next exercise. Um, all right, so in this exercise, we're going to learn a little bit about how to kind of implement logic. Um, so uh, one of the most important things for implementing, you know, logic, I guess, business logic, um, is this bool class. So bool uh, differs from the type boolean. So in TypeScript, there's a type called Boolean, which is the normal Boolean type, true and false. Bool is a little bit different. It's Booleans that can be used inside of ZK Snarks. So um, they're very similar to normal Booleans. We have the kind of typical Boolean methods. Um, you can call dot and, um, you can call dot or, you can do dot not to negate it. Um, but you cannot use bool uh, in an if statement. So boolean, you can use in an if statement, bool, verboten, not allowed to use in an if statement. Instead, you have to use this kind of ternary construct, which we call circuit.if. Um, and what that does is it takes, it takes either a bool or a boolean um, uh, and two values, like a then and an else, and uh, it returns a value. So um, if the bool is true, then it will return the first branch. If it's false, it will return the second branch. And this is something which you may have seen in other presentations, which um, many proof systems, including kimchi currently, although that um, very, very well might change in the future, does not really support branching in terms of execution. It supports sort of branching in terms of values. So if you want to do branching, you kind of have to run both branches to get a value and then use a kind of a ternary expression. Um, although that may change in the future, that's currently how it works. Um, so uh, that's just kind of a, a little bit of an uh, over, overview of how logic works. Um, we're not going to use if in this exercise, but um, I suppose you could actually, but um, just uh, for people's reference. So, okay, so this exercise is going to be something a little bit more interesting than just updating state. And we're also going to see a little bit of how zero knowledge comes into play. Um, what we're going to do is define a snap account that you can send from if you provide a signature from any signature from any public key in a given list. Okay, um, you can think about this as kind of one out of n multisig. So this is how you would implement one out of n multisig in Mina. Um, now I'm going to switch to the code view. All right, five exercise. All right, so um, the first thing we're gonna do is define a type. So uh, in snarky.js, I, I said that any value that you want to use as an argument to a method has to have, um, has to somehow be built out of field elements. And concretely, what that means in snarky.js is you extend this circuit value class. So if you want to have your own type that you can use um, uh, as an argument to a method, you extend the circuit value class. And um, so this is just going to be a, a simple type that's going to represent a signature along with the signer of that signature. Um, so it's just going to be a class that has two pieces of data, signature and signer, a signature and a public key. Um, now let's look at the smart contract itself. It's going to have a parameter, which is the list of owners of the account. So we're going to do one out of n multisig against some list of owners. And that's simply going to be an array of public keys. Now notice, this is not a state variable, but a contract parameter. So what that means is this list of owners is not stored on chain. It's actually kind of hard coded in the code of this smart contract. And as I mentioned um, in response to a, a comment, the code of a smart contract by default is not publicly available. It's not stored on chain. Only a, uh, a hash of it kind of is stored on chain. Um, 
So, okay, so how uh, are we going to implement the one out of n multisig? Um, we're going to define a method called spend for our smart, car, smart contract, and that's going to take as two, uh, two arguments, one an amount, and two, a signature with a signer. Then um, what we're going to do is check that the signer in that signature is equal to some public key in the list. So we're going to use some func we're going to define a function called contains public key. Um, it'll take a list of public keys and a public key and return a bool. Um, so it will return true if the given public key is in the list and false if the given public key is not in the list. And then we're going to assert that that equals true. So this is going to check that the person who created the signature is uh, in our list of owners. Next, um, uh, we're going to verify the signature against the given public key. Um, and I also added a nonce state variable. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry, this is the nonce from the account. So all accounts have a nonce. Um, and we're going to verify the signature against the nonce so that signatures can't be reused. Um, this isn't really necessary, but just to kind of give you an idea of how to use the nonce as well. Uh, finally, once all, if we get through here, we can uh, spend the amount. And that we just do, again, by calling this.balance.sub in place. Okay. So uh, that's the logic of how this multi-sig works. Um, and uh, just to explain a little bit, well, actually, let me go back to sharing. Just to explain a little bit how does your knowledge come into play, into play here, as I said, all the, method, all the arguments to a method are by default private. And so what that means is this signature and the public key along with it is totally private. So when you execute the smart contract, there's no way, if you look on chain, there's no way of knowing which public key in the list was it that uh, authorized the spend. That is totally hidden by zero knowledge. And um, moreover, if the account code is, is not published anywhere, so like if you just create this and share it with your friends who um, have some of the public private keys corresponding to the public keys in the account, um, the list of public keys is also not private. So um, all, all the logic of how this works is also, can also be totally hidden. Um, all right, so for this exercise, uh, what you're gonna wanna do is implement this contains public key function. Um, and uh, what I recommend is check out the methods on public key and in particular, check out this equals method. So this uh, takes another public key and returns a Boolean um, checking if they're equal. So see if you can, see if you can use the equals method um, to uh, check that this public key X is equal to some element of this array. I'll just give you five minutes to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's 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 take a look here. Um, hey, Jason. Um, Abel B asks a good question, and Jason gave a good answer. Uh, Abel B's question was: um, So the availability of such list of public keys is on behalf of the client and could be lost forever. Indeed. Um, to quote Jason, uh, in Isaac's example, that's me, uh, he chose, that's me, I chose, to maintain the privacy of the list of public keys. Alternatively, you could store it on chain if desired, but it wouldn't be private in that case, of course. True. Also, you could store it somewhere else off chain. So you could store it on IPFS, or you could store it on um, a server that you have somewhere, or you could store it, um, on a hard drive uh, in your basement, um, I don't know, or whatever. Uh, There's also a good one that I've seen a couple times in here. What happens if you have an infinite loop? Do you want to answer that? Very good question. So um, if you have an infinite loop, okay. Uh, the, hmm, let's see, how, how can I explain this? Um, I, I can, you I can't can't Sorry, go ahead, Jason, you were going to say. So uh, because it's just JavaScript and it's running in the, the, the user's web browser, an infinite loop would result in a smart contract that doesn't finish execution. And if it doesn't finish execution, you're not going to generate the zero knowledge proof or the transaction. 
So you end up in a, a state where if you have a broken smart, smart contract, uh, the developer would need to fix their code and, and redeploy in order to have successful user interaction. With them. Yeah, and actually you wouldn't, you probably, depending on what your loop looked like, you probably wouldn't even be able to deploy it because um, we kind of run the whole contract to generate a circuit. Um, and if you have an infinite loop, like that process is never gonna finish, so. All right, so uh, I hope everyone had a chance to check out that exercise. I'm going to um, share my screen and, and Oh, you just muted yourself, Isaac. We just didn't hear the last minute oh, or the okay. last, just the last thing you said, not minute, the last like. Oh, okay. I'm, right. So I'm just, uh, I'm sharing my screen to show the solution. All right. So, uh, contains public key. Well, here was my implementation. It's kind of functional programming style. Um, we map over the array of public keys and for each one we check, is it equal to X, our input? And then we call dot reduce with bool.org. So this is gonna say like, either it's equal to the first thing in the list or it's equal to the second thing or it's equal to the third thing or blah, 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 blah. If we were so inclined, we could also use a for loop. So we could say, oh, let res equal new bool false. And then say, you know, i equals zero, i is less than x is dot length. Oh, this is the generic version. Okay, anyway, uh, oh. I'll go up here so we can do the specific version. Um, I is less than X is that length plus plus I. Um, result equals result dot or um, uh, X is I dot equals X. And then return result. So that would be another way of implementing the same logic. And um, I'll just mention um, TypeScript's type system is very powerful. Um, and this can enable us to you know, program in a really nice way. For example, we can write a generic version of the contains public key function, which would check uh, that anything is contained in the list as long as it implements this eek interface that um, I defined right here. So um, this function can take a list of anything, an array of anything, which implements the eek interface and return a Boolean and it works in exactly the same way. The code is identical. Um, I can even replace it with this imperative version if people like that. And it, it all type checks, it works great. So that's the really nice thing about using TypeScript is you have this great type system that's very flexible um, and, uh, and yeah, and very powerful. Um, all right, so, uh, Cool. I'm back. So, um, a bit of review with this exercise. Um, we use here a user defined type, the signature with signer. Um, and I just want to point out how this works. If you want to use a type as a method argument, I'm just, I know I said this already, but I'm just going to say it again. If you want to use the type as a method argument or a state variable, you must, number one, extend this circuit value class. And number two, use the at prop uh, decorator on all the properties in your class. And that's going to enable you to use it as a method argument or a state variable. So uh, with that, we come towards the end of our uh, exercises. And uh, Anna, can I get a time check? There's temp Is there 10 minutes left? Is that right? Do I have more? 40 minutes? I'm not sure. Yeah, you have more. Um, you have, what is it? It's like... It's 10, 20. Minutes. You have 25 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, there's Mine lots of other, there's lots of questions we can talk about. So I oh, okay. think we need to... So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the end of the presentation and then I will, um, and then, and then we'll, we'll do questions. Perfect. All right. So uh, we're very close here. Thank you, everyone. You've been a beautiful audience. Uh, in the chat, very patient. And um, as a little as a little treat, we're gonna talk about um, how recursion looks like in SnarkyJS. So recursion is, oh, recursion is a very, 
I feel like currently kind of an arcane thing. So uh, what I mean by that is it's very, it seems kind of complicated and like specialized and you know, blah, blah, blah. So what is recursion? It's verifying zero knowledge proofs inside of a zero knowledge proof. And this is a really powerful technique because it lets you do a lot of things. For example, um, uh, like implementing um, rollups, ZK rollups is, uh, is really easily done using recursion. And a lot of the teams that are implementing ZK rollups do it using recursion. But um, it's really complicated and, you know, kind of uh, hard to get your mind around and um, really hard to implement because it requires all this crazy cryptography. Um, and in Snarky.js, uh, we, so this, is, this is not uh, yet fully public, um, publicly available, but we have an interface for making recursion a snap, ha ha ha, which is an idiom meaning making it very easy. Um, and we can, it's so easy that you can define a simple ZK rollup in like only 150 lines of code. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, if you open, you open in the repo, uh, this bonus file, and get a feel for it. So I'm going to turn off my camera, open bonus. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, this whole example because it's pretty complicated, but um, as you can see, the core of this rollup is from line 87 down to line 148. So actually only 60, 60 lines, basically, um, 61 lines. And um, it makes uh, defining uh, this under the hood, this uses recursion, but um, uh, it can be defined really simply and easily. So. Um, this rollup uh, is going to be like defined as a proof system, and it's going to have sort of three sorry, three branches to that proof system. Um, one for processing deposits into the rollup, one for transacting on the rollup, and one and this is where the recursion comes in for combining two proofs together to get a single proof. So this is kind of the magic secret sauce of recursion is that you can combine proofs together. So this, this takes two different rollup proofs and returns a rollup proof. And this is actually a lot how, like how Mina works. So um, uh, the logic for uh, merging two, two things, and don't worry if this is confusing because, well, uh, it's just supposed to be cool. Um, the logic is as simple as basically checking that these two proofs kind of line up with each other. And that's it. And all of the actual verification of the recursive proofs happens for you automatically. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's just a taste of this recursion API. Um, it's really nice and simple. And I hope, you know, we'll see a lot of cool applications of recursion because it's been something to this point that's been really specialized and not really available for developers to play with. Um, so uh, that should be cool. And this kind of goes back to, I think, a question, I can't remember who asked it, but um, about kind of defining peer-to-peer -peer ZK rollups. Well, you can implement something very similar to this and you know, it could run in a browser, it could run on you know, devices anywhere and you can call into it using JavaScript. And so um, this actually you can use you know, independent uh, uh, of a snap, you can, you can kind of create these proof systems. And so that's really nice and simple. So uh, with that, I will stop screen sharing. Um, and uh, return to the slides. Oh. Oh, yeah, what's up? You good, Anna? All good. I have questions, but we'll do that when you're ready. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and just to, let's just wrap up here. So uh, there's a couple things we didn't cover. One is we didn't cover how you interact with the Mina state. Uh, for example, like getting the current block height or like current timestamp to do things with time. Um, and that's pretty simple, but we didn't cover it. So, uh, you know, sorry, <laughs> you can read the docs. Um, 
We also didn't cover the whole API that's provided in the standard library, for example, group operations and operations with Merkle trees, which is really useful for kind of interacting with off-chain storage. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's unfortunately what we didn't cover. Um, check out the docs or you know future presentations of ours. And if you're in the MENA Builders program or come into the bootcamp, see you soon, and we'll talk about some of these things. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to, to kind of put a pin in it, or no, no, not put a pin, put a cherry on top. Uh, that's not even really the right idiom, but uh, here are some ways you can kind of stay connected with us. Um, if you go to miniprotocol.com slash snarkyjs, I believe there is a feedback form um, if you want to uh, provide any feedback or um, help shape the future development of snarkyjs. Um, and otherwise, we have our links on GitHub, uh, where to follow us on Twitter, and how to um, you know, join our Discord where uh, you can come chat about snaps. So thank you, everyone. You've been a beautiful audience. And um, now we're going to, I guess, do questions. Um, also, there are Discord channels too. Uh, so you can join the Snap Dash Developers channel on, uh, on Discord. And do stick around because we are doing the closing ceremony of the CK Hack right after this. But we still have 20 minutes. And I know that there was a lot of questions, and a lot of them got answered, but it might be interesting for our video viewers to actually hear some of those. So even if there's answers on some of these in the QA, potentially. Wondering, Jason, I mean, I think Jason and Isaac, you'll be able to pick out the really kind of good ones, but I think it would be great yeah. if we can hear a bit more. Let me answer one uh, just for clarity. Uh, was it explained why bool is necessary instead of using a native Boolean? Uh, so Isaac briefly touched on this. Uh, it's just because the operations inside, inside of a snark um, are done differently. So uh, a couple, couple things are done differently. Uh, and one is, uh, you instantiate a bool using new bool as opposed to JavaScript new boolean. Um, so that's one. And then secondly, uh, there's not turn, standard ternaries are not supported inside of uh, a snark. So we have uh, circuit.if to to provide provide that as as Isaac discussed. Um, I'm just going to take another question here. Um, so this was, an, I'm, I'm just going through questions in the Q&A. A lot of them are already answered, but I'm going to try to add some, a little bit of extra to them. So uh, Jeff asked, with tools like Snark, SnarkJS plus Circom, that's another tool, there's a limit to the number of constraints uh, with the WASM proof generator, something like 1 million. Are there analogous proof limitations here? So um, yes, actually. So there is a limit to the number of constraints um, that you can use. Um, in a single method. Uh, it's a bit like the gas block limit in Ethereum. So there's a limit to what you can use in one method, um, but you can have as many methods as you want and um, that you know all have up to that limit. And um, as mentioned by Brandon, uh, you can also use recursion to uh, have an arbitrarily large computation. So typically, you know, what a computation looks like is not a random giant circuit, but something with a lot of structure that's kind of repeated. And if you use a recursion, then you can um, you can you can do this, uh, and and you can even actually have arbitrary kind of structure too. But it's it's a little more uh, involved. Um, let's see. Moving on. Um, let's see. So Fab um, Fabrizio asks, do you have to use the extra circuit size even if you did not use recursion? Um, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but uh, no, you don't need to use, you use what you pay, you pay for what you use. So um, if you don't, you know, go up to the max limit of constraints, you don't, you don't really pay for that. Um, okay, Vim asks, which hash functions are supported for verification on chain? So um, currently in SnarkyJS, the only thing exposed is Poseidon. So this is a, a Poseidon hash function that's used in Mina. Um, and that's what you can use in SnarkyJS. Uh, there is an uh, undergoing, uh, you know, there is planned work to implement um, uh, other hash functions that are more commonly used in other situations, like SHA-256, for example. Um, and that 
you know, will eventually be um, easily available in Snarky.js. Um, so uh, James asks, uh, since this all looks kind of ready, I'm curious what still needs to be done before these will work on mainnet. So uh, we're currently, you know, finishing up um, testing uh, uh, snaps and kind of, you know, making sure it's it's ready to be deployed on mainnet. Um, and uh, you know, there should be an announcement sometime, um, you know, in the not too distant future about you know what kind of times that you can expect. But there's nothing kind of publicly announced yet. Um, let's see. So Anonymous asks, is there a bridge over to Ethereum? This is a great question. Um, there is a bridge. Uh, so we, so Mina Foundation um, has been working with uh, Ethereum Foundation um, and NIL Foundation uh, on a bridge between Mina and Ethereum, which will enable Mina State to be verified on Ethereum. And that's really cool because it uses the succinctness of Mina to just verify the full Mina proof and the full Mina blockchain um, in Ethereum, so you get basically a bridge with like full node security, um, which which is really cool. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, Jason, are there any questions that you would like to answer? I've just been kind of running through, but you're muted. Somebody did ask, um, do I mean snaps in general? Uh, we'll, we'll have a, a few different channels. So uh, there is a snaps general, and there either is or will be very soon a snaps developer channel also on Discord. Um, all right, so uh, Kobe asks, what point in the develop, compile, deploy, run pipeline would we catch invalid proof slash state transitions? Um, like if you just printed yourself money out of thin air, that's a great question. So um, when you, uh, basically when you try and generate the proof, so when you try and run the contract locally, it will fail if you do something that's not allowed, like print money out of thin air. And, uh, you know, yeah, so that's kind of that, but, um, if you somehow, you know, created a proof, like circumvented what's going on in SmartKeyJS and created a proof, if you broadcast to the network, it would it would fail at that point because the network would see, oh, you're trying to print money out of thin air. That's not allowed. Um, someone asks, for those of us attending the workshop this weekend, what would you suggest we invest time into to prepare for it, other than the exercises, of course? Um, Jason, is there anything, you know, you can think of suggesting for those? who may be attending our bootcamp? Uh, good question. Uh, I, the setup that Isaac did today, as far as having VS Code or your preferred editor um, in Node 16 uh, are the, really the requirements for it. So if, if you follow along today, you'll be good to go for uh, Thursday. Um, cool. Um, let's see. Someone asks, is it possible to develop on Mina if we don't like JS? Well. Yes, as long as you like OCaml. So if, if you really want it, you could use OCaml um, uh, to write your small, smart contracts as well. But Snarky.js is our kind of primary um, development uh, platform. Um, let's see. So someone asks, for those who, aren't, who can't attend the work bootcamp, can we expect more events in the future? Definitely. Um, no news on on what, but you know, stay tuned on Twitter, on our Discord um, for any updates about uh, more events. Um, as we roll out snaps, you know, we'll, we will be doing a lot of um, uh, engagement with the developer community um, to help out with, with building snaps. Mm. All right. Um, I mean, I can I can keep asking, answering questions here. Um, someone asks, uh, for the reason that we use Node.js, could the hash function that hash functions be used? So they're asked, So I believe this question is, if the hash function is available in Node.js, can it be used in Snarky.js? The answer is not exactly because the hash function needs to be a, needs to be redefined to. Uh, work with the types of Snarky.js. So it would need to be redefined to accept field elements or bool 
as input. Um, and for that, we would need to, you know, you'd need to re-implement it either directly in constraints using Snarky.js or um, what we are planning on doing, which is actually integrating it into our kimchi proof system itself so it's available very efficiently. Um, okay, so uh, Francesco asks, any plans to re reduce block time and introduce deterministic finality? That's a great question. Um, it is something that, you know, we're, that's definitely on our mind. There's no concrete plan um, yet that's in place to, to address that, but um, I, 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 you know, I believe you should uh, uh, stay posted on that because I think, you know, that will be something that um, is, is, you know, uh, I can't speak for me to foundation, but I believe that that will be something that's, you know, that will be important to them going forward. Um, okay. Uh, oh, Anna. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. Isaac. I mean, do you want to do one more question? And then yeah, yeah. I know there's some people asking kind of like if we're wrapping up soon. So I think we're going to head yeah. over to the stage after that, but maybe just do one more question. Perfect. Cool. Um, all right. So just having a look here. Um, oh, just curious. What was the reasoning for OCaml as the underlying language for Mina? Uh, I have answered this question a few times in the past. Um, I mean, I think, uh, okay, uh, you know, the real reason is Amino was created by people like myself who have their own history and, uh, you know, abilities and whatever. And, um, you know, I guess uh, my own history involves writing a lot of OCaml code. Um, and that was kind of the... <laughs> The reason, I guess, you know, realistically speaking, that we chose OCaml, but um, I think OCaml is a very nice programming language and um, you know, good for writing uh, secure code. So um, there's all sorts of reasons I can tell you that I think OCaml is a good language, but I think the real answer is it's what me and and the other initial developers like Brandon were familiar with, um, and yeah, happy to use. So. It's worth also adding to that that uh, uh, other ecosystem members, uh, Chainsafe in particular, um, are working on Node, a Node in Rust right now. Awesome. All right, Isaac, Jason, are you? Do we feel good? Should we wrap up? I mean, you can actually questions tab and keep going with more, but I think. No, we'll let's wrap it up. Yeah, let's Shall wrap we do it. it? Okay, so. It. So thank you so much for the MENA session. This is the last workshop of ZK Hack. It's been amazing. And I know for a lot of people, this is their first look into the SNAPS world and they're so excited. You can kind of get that from the crowd. Very cool. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks again for doing this session. And people have asked, the videos for this will be on the YouTube channel as soon as we can get them there. So, We've shared the link. Uh, maybe we can share it again in here after a bit. But for right now, if you can head over to the stage, I'm going to be doing sort of the ZK Hack wrap up closing ceremony where we look at, you know, the six weeks and the prizes that some of the hackers have gotten. So I hope you'll see me there. And yeah, just remember there's a 40 second delay on that. So if I'm a little like stumbly with the with the chat, I apologize. I'm not seeing your notes at the right time. Anyway, see you soon.